Everybody, what's happening? Welcome. It's the Wednesday revolution of one live stream coming at you on Wednesdays, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Whether you're watching the recording or watching it live, welcome, welcome. Um, last week, we uh, were joined by the Urban Monk and we talked about race. We talked about the riots and, and a number of things related to it. And we wanted to do a follow-up discussion this week and we want to dive into um, a, a, a number of, a, a really a couple of topics. One is is this idea of how to talk with your family about race. You know, uh, one, one question that's been coming in a lot to a lot of people, not just me, is what do I tell my kids, you know? Um, and, and how do I find that balance between preparing my children for the real world uh, and, and, and helping them deal with the real world in a nuanced way, but also, um, how, how do I make sure I tell them in a way that doesn't traumatize them, you know, uh, in, in the mere act of telling, you know? Um, so uh, in th there are monsters in the real world, although monsters take human form, and um, you, you you want your children to, to be aware of the reality of evil, the reality of monsters, but then at the same time, you might cost them some sleep. How do you do it? How, 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 do, how do you navigate that, that complex terrain? Uh, and then we want to talk about ministry as well. Um, you know, th th there's a lot of debate and especially in evangelical churches right now about the gospel and about social justice. You got people that are saying, hey, just preach the gospel, just preach love. We don't, we don't have to talk about this other stuff. And then there are those that are saying, no, we got to talk about this stuff. This is a part of the gospel. Is it? Well, today we have our guest, the urban monk, my brother, my own flesh and blood, Pastor Gerald Coleman, who's going to be uh, joining us today to talk about his experience. Um, and then we got my brother, what now, Kamau back in the fold, helping me hold it down. So G, what's happening, man? How you feeling this week, brother? Man, I feel good. Been a busy week, but uh, beautiful weather. Um, I'm feeling lovely, man. I got no complaints. Not today, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, it's always good to have you on the show with us, brother. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to dive in, man. Let, let's talk about topic number one, this idea of raising your kids to develop cross-cultural IQ. Before we even get into, oh, what do you tell your kids or advice or insight? I, I want to dive into your stories as a father, a father of, of six biracial children and, and, and some of the things that you have observed or experienced just with raising your kids. And, and then we can we can just go from there, man. So the, so the mic is all yours, brother. Oh, wow. So um, my my wife and I, we made a early decision. Uh, to bring our kids up in a way where they gained a wide array of experiences and they learned to get along with all people. And so that's been reflected in my wife and I and our relationships with other people. So, you know, TK, you know, growing up, we've got people that we call uncles and aunts that they are no, they're of no blood relationship, you know. Oh, that's my uncle. That's my uncle. That's my cousin right there. And so my kids have uncles and aunts and cousins who are not blood relationship to them or not even the same ethnicity. And so we've sought to raise them up in that environment. And so they've got a good glimpse of that. But I can think of, of various experiences. Um, one happened uh, about two years ago, or maybe three now, when we lived uh, in the Michigan area. And this was during the, uh, the year when Pre President Trump was first elected. <laughs> and uh, my son, he is uh, having a conversation with a friend and, you know, somehow they're talking about politics and the boy who is white says to him, hey, don't worry if uh, if President Trump reinstitutes slavery because I'll, I'll treat you well. You could be my slave and I'll treat you well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this this Woo! kid thought that was okay, right? <laughs> he he yeah. thought that how, was how okay. Old, how old G? Um, Aslan was 11 at the time. Yeah. So you're talking about kids Jeez. in the fifth grade. And so you're like, what the what? Like, uh, what did he say? And was so, your initial feelings was it anger? Oh, absolutely, anger at the statement. But I think too, uh, like you know, this kid 
where like where where does he even get that type of thinking from you know of knowing that this has to be something in this kid's culture that even makes him think that that's okay to even rationalize and here he is he he thinks he's being helpful you know like <laughs> equivalent he say hey i'll be a good slave master so you don't have to worry like come on um another uh story uh more recent um my son well my son's elementary school let me let me tell you about this one um and the elementary school will remain nameless but this happened last year for black history month if you do your homework you can find it in an article but you got to put all of those pieces together i won't lead you too much further but uh at my son's elementary school for black history month um one parent went into the school and saw a poster celebrating black inventors. And so it listed the, the black inventor's name, their invention, but the parent began to notice that they were all white faces. And, and there was one, one white face that had on a Confederate uniform. And so the parent immediately you know, took pictures and, and went to talk to the principal about it alerted other parents about it and we're like wait wait how how does this happen and we found out that it had been up for a couple of weeks and nobody in the school noticed it and like how how does that happen and so that that gives you a little bit of the cultural awareness of, of what's happening in the school that that poster was up for about two weeks and it took another black parent to see that to be able to bring that to their attention um uh, another story I, b I believe i shared the one about my son i'm not sure um but he uh he was in the fifth grade and this is the same elementary school um they were on the bus and another fifth grader who's who was in another classroom had been assigned a book to read and in the book they were reading it had the derogatory term the n-word in it um, and so the girl, his, um, who was in the other class, but also in fifth grade on the bus, looks at my son and says, I know what you are. Hmm. And he's like, what are you talking about? And she says, you're a N word and, uh, rocked my son. He came home and he just sobbed in his mother's lap. I mean, I mean, sobbed. I've never seen him cry so hard. And this was the first time that he was kind of confronted. And, you know, my son, um, so my wife is Puerto Rican. And so th he is probably the lightest of all my sons. And so he is, I mean, weeping, sobbing. And uh, we had to confront that situation. Later, we find out that the teacher had assigned this book and did not alert the parents that that word was in the textbook. Um, and so the parents could have been prepared to address that situation. Needless to say, we were able to, after trying uh, with, uh, after some vain attempts, we were finally able uh, to get the parents' information and have a conversation and we were able to work through that. Uh, and the parents were very apologetic and said that they were taking steps uh, to educate their daughter, to let her know that that's not okay. But that's that's elementary school. Now we go to the middle school level. My son had, within a matter of two weeks, had been called the N word. And one, we found out um, one of the kids uh, was a, a special needs kid. And so we're meeting with the principal. We're with my son, and the principal says, "Well, don't worry about that. You know." that kid won't ever say anything to your son again because we're going to keep him separate so your son won't even interact with him and my son he speaks up and he says well maybe that's what the problem is is that he's never interacted with anyone different so he doesn't know any difference so that's why he felt free to say that mm -hmm. i don't think that's a, a viable solution and that's my son who was in the seventh grade when that happened um so turn around a week after that, my son is in the lunchroom. 
uh, a young man walks up to him and says the, the N word again to him. And my son says, what did you say? And he stood up as if he was going to hit the boy. And the boy said, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I won't say that again. My son went immediately to the principal's office and he told the principal, he says, can you please call my parents? I am highly upset. I'm going to take a walk and I'll be back after I cool down. Which, Doc, you know for you and I, well, Doc, you know if that would have been you, you know what would have happened. <laughs> but um, I for, don't. Please for tell. You. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't don't ruin, don't ruin my brand. <laughs> <laughs> but at that age, um, you know, yeah, yeah. I would I would have been in trouble. But to show that he to show that he was able to control himself and process him, his emotions, I was very impressed with him that he took that walk. And that happened in a matter of two weeks. The principal's response was, this has never happened before. To which, you know, my wife and I, our, our reply was, nah, this is the first time that you've been made aware that this has happened. This, this is quite more common than you think. Um, so you want me to keep going with stories? <laughs> really quickly, I, I, I do, I really do. Uh, really quickly though, it's kind of interesting, right, to to think about things in terms of um, what you can learn by just observing a situation without taking it personally, without being defensive, right? I think one of the greatest deterrents to learning is defensiveness. When you look at your exposure to a set of ideas or a set of experiences, no matter what they are, as a kind of threat, it makes it hard to, to, to grow in your thinking. And, and I think about when that teacher says, hey, like this has never happened before, it's like, the need to the need to have that opinion, the need to establish that, right? The need to even convince oneself of that narrative rather than just be agnostic about it. Like, man, I wonder if this has happened before. You know, like if it happened yeah. now, I sure hope it hasn't happened before. But 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 you know, when you, when you kind of listen with a sense of like, oh no, what does it mean about me that this happened on my turf? You know, I, I got to rush to make sure I establish a narrative that this hasn't happened before. I think that's one of the things that really prevents a lot of discussions on 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 differences in culture from moving forward in a way where everybody can learn from each other. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because this is all the same school district, you know, and mm -hmm. the elementary kind of school, the middle school. That's what I found interesting is that, you know, this is a, a school and, and I, I often I've heard a lot of parents talk about that a lot of the things that happen, you know, when it comes to their kids happen at school. Like this is a place that in sometimes you pay to send them to, but it's a place either or that you expect them to go and be safe, that, that you're trusting yes. the staff, you're trusting the district. Um, you, you know, this this is a place of learning. Schools is, are supposed to be um you know an extension of the home in some way where 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 kids are being nurtured and and, and it happens so much just kind of um confront a lot of the real world solutions and and a lot of times you know as a parent it, it seems like you you know you're preparing them you're building the endurance for them in the home for them to go to school where in most places, like this isn't the real world. This is still a controlled environment, but nonetheless, you know, getting exposed by such harsh realities. And then the second thing is that, you know, when when your son was when the when the girl on the bus called your son the N word, you know, even at his young age, if he didn't understand all the weight and all the historical background um, that that comes with that word, I think that the way that that word is said, there's there's usually hate in it. Like, again, yeah. even if he didn't, didn't understand like what that meant for the last 400, 500 years, 600 years, he understood, he just, he could feel the hatred, the, the disdain, the disgust um, that was being communicated to him that like, that, you are this and and it's not just a matter of fact one word but it carries feelings that even if you don't know those origins you still can feel that 
Yeah, th yeah. Th those are great points. I, um, I'd like to talk about the school supposed to be a safe place to learn. And, um, mm. you know, that's that's more than security. You know, most people think, hey, if you've got security there, you know, that's great. But for my my son or my children, African-American, black, Puerto Rican, they're in the they go to the schools and they have to live with um, what W.E.B. Du Bois terms as double consciousness. The fact that I am aware that I am always different when you're not in the majority culture. And so they're always aware of that fact. Now you put on top of that all of the rules that you have to keep, making sure that you don't do anything to stick out more than you already do. <laughs> and the amount of stress, like how, how can you learn adequately? You know, how can you balance all of that fear, all of that stress so that you can learn and be free and open to learn as you would fully be, like to be able to. Um, now, they got it done, but I, I don't think sometimes that white people are aware of the stress when you're talking about making schools a safe place. Like, are you aware, really, that it takes a whole lot for my kids to get up in the morning and just recognize, okay, we're going to be the only black kids on the bus. <laughs> you know, we're going to go into an environment where we're going to hear things in the classroom that do not reflect our experiences we're mm. in a in a building with all white staff and faculty who is for us and um if i if i can share one more story here um there was a story my daughter this was her sophomore year of high school um she was uh, on the track team and there was another um black girl on the team uh, who got called the N word? No, yeah, she got called the N word and the B word, which is uh, which, which is terrible. But the girl erupted and was ready to fight. They broke it up, and my daughter is standing there watching this. And then to the side, she sees a couple of white girls talking about it, and they're making fun of the way the black girl spoke, and they're laughing and giggling. And that just sent my daughter over the edge. And she's like, I can't take it. I need to go talk to someone. And she's walking into the school, which is, which rightly she's like, I gotta go find somebody because in her mind, she think, she's thinking, this is a safe place. I can talk to somebody here. But as she enters the building, she begins to think about the fact that, wait a minute, no one here looks like me. How are they gonna be able to understand what I'm going through? And so her next move was, I got to call mom to come get me because I can't talk to anyone here. So I, I think that y your um, analysis is right, Kamal. Th those are some tough things. You know, yeah, I, one of the things... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, brother. I was All just right, going to say... We acting uh, like... <laughs> we acting like yeah, I'm going to be playing right now. And that, that first finals uh, against the Mavericks, where it's like, well, you got it. Well, I got it. Well, you got it. Well, you, you go ahead, man. You got it. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> I, well, I was gonna say that I, I I completely can relate to that. Um, you know, I I I initially started off in a private school um, that was majority white, and and I think you know, as a child growing up, um, I think first of all, I think just even. As a child, you know, when you're first born, when, when you come into this world, you don't see uh, like racism. You don't understand that. You you notice the difference between like, okay, you're white, um, I'm darker skin. This girl is kind of like more like caramel uh, coffee um, skin tone. But like, we're all we're still all on the same playground. We still can all have fun. And I think you know, I I while like I noticed those differences. As a kid, like it wasn't, I think the older I got, you know, the more uh, apparent those differences were. And and you really start to understand that like, okay, what my parents are teaching me at home and what um, what is being told to me at school are conflicting. And, and, and a lot of times they're in opposition. Um, and 
the teachers and the school systems and, and the curriculum, um, you know, doesn't, it isn't designed to like empower um, black people. And obviously it serves a, a larger um, body of students from all different races, but it's, it's a lot different when you go to a black school um, where all the teachers look like you, the principal looks like you. And, and that was my experience in, in Atlanta and, and becoming um, and going to high school here and, and growing up where a lot of times it felt like it was catered to you. Like, you know, we, we understand that this isn't uh, the truth as you know it, but while we're still going to teach us, we're going to, we're just going to empower you through your experience of how you're feeling about the things, how you're uh, going through the things. And I, and I think that, you know, just the, it's such a vast difference between um, being around a lot of people who look like you and who understand the same kind of struggles. And even though, again, the curriculum is the same and the structure of the school is going to be the same, like there's just a common understanding that isn't the case when, you know, you're in a mi minority school. It's true, man. So true. You, you know, one of the things that it, it really bothers me because it, it, it not only reinforces the same old narratives that lead us nowhere, in my opinion, but it, but it robs people of the opportunity to learn some of the most interesting things about Black experience. And, and it's this, there, there's kind of like this perception that if, if Black people were, were, if we were left to ourselves, we would never think about racism as a, as a real thing, as a real factor in our lives. But, but there's this political faction, you know, the left, right? And, and they come along and they trick us into believing in something that isn't consistent at all with any aspect of how we experience the world. And so there's this idea of like, hey, the problem of, of race is talking about race. Race isn't an issue, but see, there are these people over here who have a lot of money, who make a lot of money by talking about race and making everybody angry. And that's really the problem. And I think it's possible to acknowledge that both of those things could be true at the same time. It, it, it can be true that there are people who attempt to exploit racial suffering for political gain. We can acknowledge that that's, that that's real, but that's a separate thing from black people's experience, right? And, and, and you know, like when I look at, at the story, you know, of my life, of your life, of, of your children, these were not children going into an environment expecting to be treated poorly because they had a dogmatic belief that everything in their life is about race, right? They didn't go into it feeling like all oh, white people hate me. In many cases, they were in an environment where they felt like, hey, I'm among friends. I'm just here having a good time. I don't want to believe that racism is a problem. I rather believe we just all buddies. And then they have a moment where their skin color is thrown in their faces and they're surprised by it. They're shocked by it. They hurt because of it. And if we can resist the temptation to reduce everything to this battle between left and right and say, well, let's, let's sit that conversation over here. We can come back to that. But let's talk about the actual experience and let's hear what black people have to say about their own experience independently mm -hmm. of what you think the left or the right is trying to do as part of some broader cultural war. Yeah, I, I'm with you, man. You you just reminded me of an, another experience that I had uh, when we moved to the suburbs and we were going to a private Catholic school. And I remember at recess, we were getting ready to play tag. And uh, this kid, he kneels down, you know, you put your feet in the middle and the kid goes, any, mini, miny, mo, catch an N word by his toe. And I'm like, what? I was like, what, what did he just say? And then an another white kid who was aware hit him and said, hey, don't say that word. And then the kid looked at him like, what? Don't hit me. That's how it goes. And, you know, I, I, I'm then in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is how y'all really get down. This is how it goes. That's not how it goes. When I played it, I've never said that. <laughs> and, you know, it's just the reality that for 
this is the normal reality. Like I didn't come into that situation thinking that, okay, you know, this is a game attack. They're going to treat me unfairly mm. because I'm black or they're going to say mm. something. You know, I went in there because I want to play tag. I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm about to have fun. Yep. I'm going to show my speed. You're not going to catch yep. me. And off guard, I mean, I get smacked with the N-word. And now yeah. I'm messed up for the rest of this game. I'm like, this is what y'all do out here. Like, I, it's totally shocked. So, yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah, <laughs> I, I get what you're so saying. I, I, Let I, me I, calm down. Let me breathe. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 man. I, I, think this is, uh, I think this is interesting and good for a lot of people to hear. So a uh, couple of stories for me related to that. I remember one time uh, I got you expelled from school because... I, I was on the playground. Too. Yeah, yeah. I, I was on a playground, and this, this was during recess, elementary school, all white oh. school we went to, and there was a kid who was, I think, two grades above me. I, um, I still remember the cat's name, man. I'm not even gonna say his name, I but, do, but you I, know I, what I I'm talking about. Instantly. Yeah, yeah. And that that kid came up to me. I didn't do anything to that. I, I can already see in my imagination just like half the people I know refusing to accept this as true because they think I want them to vote for Joe Biden or something like that, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, 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 no. That couldn't possibly be true. That couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> and, and hey, I, I, you know, I, I have my skepticism of stories that other people tell, but man, this dude, I, unprovoked. I was just like some scared little scrawny um, sixth grader. And this dude spit in my face and called me a slur. And I remember I just started crying. I, I didn't feel this, this this dude was kind of big. And I didn't feel confident to just like hit him. I, I just I just started crying. And I remember I started walking over to your side of the playground where y'all were playing like football or something. And I and I remember hearing I think it was Dunny Jokovic who said, oh, he's going to get Gerald. Oh, he's going to get Gerald. And I remember, <laughs> and I remember I came and I told you, you said he did what? And then like you, you stormed over in the direction of that dude and y'all start, started to hustle and tussle. And there was this incline, I remember, like closer to the school building, you guys ended up being in that yep. area. And you body slam dude, and y'all roll down the incline, you know, still fighting. And, and it got broken up pretty quickly. But I remember you got uh, maybe suspended. You didn't get expelled. I used the wrong yeah, word. Suspended. You got suspended yeah. for, for like a week or something like that for fighting. And, and I remember just all the emphasis being on, you know, you can't do that, right? Like, like you can't do that. That, 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 was, that, that was wrong of you. To, to take it to that level of violence. And so I think about your children and how none of them even went in the direction of, I'm gonna fight, right? One of them was like, I'm gonna go to the school. Another one is call my mom. Another one is I'm gonna go tell a teacher. And I, I think it's great. I, I think it's great to say, hey, look, there's a wrong way to deal with conflict, but, it, but it's important to take the conversation beyond the condemnation of a wrong way to deal with conflict. It's important mm -hmm. to yeah. also create a culture, to create an environment where people feel confident that if there is a conflict that they don't know how to handle, that's beyond their control, or that they're scared to respond to wrongly because they're gonna get suspended, here is a place that you can go you know, to talk to somebody. And I'm not talking about the safe spaces that people are criticizing politically when it comes to adults wanting to be in an environment where they're not exposed to something that they disagree with or that offends them. We're talking about children, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. In, a school, in a school, we want to create an environment where children do feel safe enough to be honest and talk with adults about things that bother them, especially if you're going to treat them really badly if they deal with it in the wrong way and rebuke them by saying, well, you should have came and talked about it, you know? Well, G, if I could hop in here, I, I do have a question because I think this, you know, as an older brother myself, um, I, I definitely could have, I can put my shoes in the ones that you were walking in as you were going over to this kid. Um, but I think it brings up a really interesting point now as a parent like what is the difference because i know the same level of anger 
is probably the first reaction, right? It's the first thing where it's like, oh, I know this little dude did not. And, and you know, it's just immediately like, okay, like I'm, I need to go confront this. I need to handle this. I need to protect um, my family. But I think there's a big difference as a younger brother who can go and, and put those hands on him. Um, and then, you know, a parent, especially a father of, what is it, four? Um, who, who has to be very six a father of six who has to be strategic in the way that you move because you're setting an example for your kids um you're you know and and just not being that angry black man right like being above it yeah. and and going and and going um and, and and just you know bringing the kind of energy that that you would like to see resolved i, I would love to just hear you expand on on that difference and and how you handle that uh, well, first, let me say that um, my kids are, they are going to be better human beings than I could ever hope to be. <laughs> let, let's put it there first. Um, uh, they are very intelligent and wise, um, although they do get into trouble, you know. Um, but I think, um, too, there's an awareness in them that I, I didn't have at that time which is if I respond a certain way, you know, as a, as a black person, this is going to go really bad for me. Mm. Um, and they've, and they've seen that happen. Yep. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I won't. Yeah. Well, let me say this. There's one girl at the, at the high school where my daughters go or where they attend and this one girl, she incited or instigated a fight by using the N-word. She went home, complained to her stepfather, who I believe is a police officer or a sheriff, something. And he started to escort her to school every day as, you know, as if she was in danger. And, and if she wasn't the one causing the problem. And, uh, and so I think my kids are aware that, wait a minute, like I have to play this in the best way possible so I don't get myself into trouble because they, they know that they're working, they feel that they're working against greater odds. And so I'm mm. glad that they came home and brought it to their parents. And so, and a lot of kudos goes to my wife in this because you know, I'm working on the other side of town and she has to be the immediate responder. And TK knows this. You do not want to get in the ring with my wife. Uh, <laughs> she, she, can, you, she gave them the business. And I think that they have to see that, that they have to know that, you know what, I'm going to advocate for my children. You're not going to be able to push them around. Uh, we <clears> want <throat> some answers. And so I think for us is it became this idea of not, I think in times past as a, as a kid, sometimes I responded like, I'm just not going to say anything about it. I know this is how it goes. Mm -hmm. And I, and I have one daughter who could go that way. And she's been saying, you know what, it's not worth saying anything because nothing is going to happen. And, you know, my wife and I, we keep saying to her, no, you got to use your voice. You have to say something, even if they don't take any action the way that we think they should do it. You got to let them know that you have a problem with. It. And mm. uh, and so uh, my wife went up to the school, you know, and this and now this is where we are in New York, where, you know, I would think is uh, pretty progressive politically. You know what I'm saying? Uh <laughs> that many may look at New York as being a leftist state politically, but they're still running into all kind of issues here where they think that, oh, we have prog we're progressive. We've got the number one school district in the Rochester area, you know? And so we confront the principals of the elementary, the middle school and the high school. We take it to the superintendent. And as we're doing this, we're realizing, wait a minute, these are people, I'm not saying that they're, they're not competent to be administrators in a school, 
but there's some incompetence in terms of dealing with these type of uh, issues of racism, right? Uh, they don't know what to do. They haven't been prepared for this. And so their number one thing is, oh, okay, okay, you know, we're, we're going to talk to it, you know, and thinking that because they talk to my wife and I or our children and the person who committed the offense that it's going to be handled when they're not rec recognizing um, elementary, middle, high, uh, there's a pattern here. There needs to be uh, more, there needs to be a proactive uh, approach rather than reactive because reactive, you're way too late. Now that you see that this is a pattern that continues to happen, what are you going to do? And it got to the point where last year, uh, my wife, she just mainly, she said, look, gee, we can't continue to leave them in here. And so we pulled them out of the school two months early and said, look, mm. you could send their work home. We can meet them at the library. But as we thought about it, it's like, how long do you tell your kids to be patient, to yeah. be cool before it starts to jade their perspective or mess with their heart? Because now, you know, I'm I'm telling my children now this is very important when we talk about uh, even systemic racism, because they would say, oh, it's not it's not system, it's not systemic. This is not our system. Our system is fine. It works. We've got the number one school district. But you don't see the damage that it's causing my children, because now my kids are watching their parents not come in and flip over desk, you know, not burn the school down, but we're approaching them and, and we're letting them know that we're, we're angry, we are hurt, uh, but we're still treating them with respect, respecting their positions, but they are doing, they are not doing anything about it. And so I remember saying to my son's principal, I said, now, listen, I'm hoping you don't let me down because we're looking for you to do the right thing. If you don't respond in the right way, and I'm trying to teach my son that when you respond in the right way, when you play by the rules, the right things happen. And so for my kids to see over and over, wait a minute, this has happened to every one of my kids who are in uh, the element, you know, I've got six. Five of my children last year all had experiences. And so at this point, it's like, I got to pull them back because you're hurting the process now. You're enabling yeah. it to happen. And by your enablement, mm -hmm. it's going to damage their heart. And that's a battle right now. I can't afford for them to keep getting beat up. You know, I'm not going to keep sending my <laughs> five-year-old back in the ring with Mike Tyson saying, no, son, you got to move a little faster. You can do it. Just endure it. No, I'm not going to do that because it begins yeah. to damage their soul. Yeah. You, you know, man, when, when I think about this question of, um, I know it's a really sensitive issue right now to to ask Black folk, hey, what can I do? If you're not Black, what can I do? Right. And and, and there's a lot of nuance behind that, that um, um, can, can be difficult to understand. I, I I heard one person explain it really well and said, you know, imagine if um, during the peak of the Me Too movement, um, a man walked up to a woman that he works with and says, hey, I've been hearing about this Me Too thing. Like, have you been sexually harassed around here? You know, have you ever had any bad experiences where anybody's assaulted you? Is that has that happened to you? You know, like it's it's this really vulnerable experience. You're, you're, you're asking someone to open up and talk to you about in the name of giving you advice, right? I, I think that's a good way to explain it. But, but, I, but I also have been thinking about this question of, all right, what, what can I say though to those people that are interested who say, man, you know what? I don't identify with that experience, but uh, I, I am curious on if there's anything you think I can do to contribute to the world being better and more cautious. And, and, and one of the things I've come up with is the principle of do no harm, right? Um, you know, b before we even talk about things like, um, hey, you know, write a check here or, or 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 go, you know, go apologize to this person. The principle of do no harm is really powerful, and and understanding the nature of things like implicit bias, it's not about making you feel guilty 
so that you can bow down to me and apologize because that doesn't improve my life. But it makes you more mindful of things that affect others that don't really affect you. And it allows you to be a powerful influence of good when you are in situations where you can squash something bad that's happening and you're not blind to it because because of this ideology that says oh well that kind of stuff doesn't happen you know um there, there, there's actually a story you haven't told that we've talked about that i think illustrates this really well so i, I want to hand it to you before i make this point actually if, if you're willing to talk about it i love to hear the story about the desk the writing on the desk because i, I yes, think this captures uh yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, so, uh, my other daughter who was a freshman last year, um, she's my second oldest. Uh, she went to her classroom with her friend who's white and they share a desk and on her friend's side of the, de the desk, there was a swastika drawn there. And on my daughter's side, there was the N word kind of carved into the table. And so they both raised their hand to tell their teacher, hey, this is on our desk. Now, mind you, this is for my daughter, this experience comes after all the other experiences that I've shared with you about. <laughs> so she's, and, and she's the one that is like, why even speak up because nothing's gonna happen. She struggles with that. And so um, they report it to the teacher and the teacher starts to yell at them saying, hey, you know, don't bring any attention to this because these kind of people who do this, they don't deserve any attention. And they're kind of looking, you know, they're in shock. And then she says, look, if, if you're offended, then move to another seat. And my daughter kind of shut down and we didn't find out about it until a friend of hers made her call home because she wasn't going to say anything until she got home later that day but her friend said no you can't let that you can't let them get away with that you got to say something call your parents go to the office and call and so we were called down and it was funny because i think it was not funny but it was interesting that the other girl who shared the desk with her, her mom called my wife the next day to find out the details because the white girl had a pet. She kind of had a panic attack and blacked out. Wow. Uh, that's how, that's how much the teacher yelling, you know, at her affected her. And so this was a situation that we had to address, had to go up to school again. And that was when we kind of made the decision, like, we we pulling out like yeah yeah these these are my kids <laughs> and we we're, we're trying to do the best that we can uh to raise them well but you you guys are failing again and here's the perfect opportunity where i'm thinking you know and i'm i haven't even been trained as a teacher in the classroom but i'm thinking wait a minute the right way to respond would have been to make this make this a teachable moment to say hey everybody <laughs> stop what you're doing we need to have a classroom chat right now like as a teacher you should feel empowered to be able to respond to that i mean because i'm thinking as a teacher this has got to be a moment that you this has got to be an opportunity that you dream of seizing right now and there was nothing done later the teacher didn't even, the teacher has never issued an apology, only an explanation of why she did what she did. But yeah, that's, that's the story. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have, I have an analogy here with, with, uh, with conspiracy theories. Um, so, so the, the question I want to propose is why do conspiracy theories gain so much life? The reason they gain so much life is because people in the mainstream usually prefer to take an approach that says, I'm not going to dignify those conspiracy theories with the response, right? That's not real science. That's not an intelligent claim. That's a laughable, idiotic thought. And so I won't dignify it with a response. 
And then when mainstream media avoids the topic, the people who believe in the conspiracy theory says, theory says oh, I know something's to this because they don't want to talk <laughs> yeah. about it, right? And then it grows even stronger. And so the main fuel feeder into the strength of a conspiracy theory is mainstream media's insistence on avoiding it because they don't want to dignify with a response. Why is that? Because they don't see the conspiracy as the problem. They see talking about it as a problem. There's an interesting analogy there. I think there's something similar going on with the race. The interesting thing about that teacher is that she was less concerned with condemning this clearly bad thing that happened and she was more concerned with making sure that no one left this situation thinking that that was a bigger problem than it was, right? The number yeah. one priority for her was making sure that the kids who were the victims of this problem didn't get it twisted, didn't think that there are a lot of people like this. Like the most important thing for me to tell you kids right now is that this doesn't happen a lot. There aren't a lot of people who think this way. And the best thing to do when you encounter this is to not talk about it, not bring it up. And she was more worried about that than worried about this problem and how it could fester and even hurt more kids. I think that's an interesting thing. The second thing is when people hear about the topic of implicit bias, there's kind of like this response of like, oh, you know, okay, so I'm just supposed to feel guilty now. I'm just supposed to believe that I'm the devil. I'm just supposed to believe that everybody's racist and I'm evil and that my heart is filled with consciously held racist intentions. No, that's, a, that's an excellent straw man, but no, it's... The value of understanding implicit bias in a moment like this would be when you know the world shows up differently for someone else than yourself, you don't create mm. additional harm by projecting your own color blindness onto someone that doesn't have the luxury of experiencing reality that way. I believe that teacher was probably sincere, right? Because I, I can get this message of, hey, look, don't make it any more powerful than it is. People like that, they're stupid, don't even give strength to them. And that's that teacher's worldview, right? But for these two young girls, they're hurting right now, you know? Yeah. And you, you can't allow the world as it is for you. It, it's like for me, I'm, I'm the type of person, no matter what I go through, my attitude is I'm gonna use it to make me better. Like you, you just, you just not really gonna catch me complaining even on a bad day because I'm just busy thinking about what I can do to make things better. But if there's a kid yeah. that's crying, I don't take that earned worldview, that perspective that it took <clears throat> me 20 years to like build and then impose that on a child and, 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 and create additional harm. And so by being aware of your biases, you can be mindful of people that are experiencing reality in a way that's different for you. And you can say what you need, like, hey, I got your back. I'm sorry that happened. I'm about to deal with it. And, and that, that's what happened to me when, when, when I was in, when we first went to our all white elementary school, uh, when, when we moved to Westchester, I was in fifth grade. And I remember we, we, would, we would go to this class, I think it was my English class, and all the kids would stand in a, in a single file line right outside the door. And, and, and the eighth grade class would come out of that at the end of their period and they walk past us. There was this dude in the eighth grade class who, I, I, I wonder if anybody else heard this, but I heard it. Whenever he would walk by, he would say nerd in word and he would snicker. And yeah, I, I was a little nerdy looking scrawny kid and all that kind of stuff, but he would say nerd in word and snicker. I only heard him do it. I don't know if anybody else heard it, but I heard it. For half the school year, I experienced that. And I remember when we used to go stand outside that classroom, I would get so scared. I would get so tense because I knew this moment was coming where I was gonna be called the N-word. So I remember later on in the school year, you know, we, we, we had a parent teacher thing and, and, and there was something about the conversation with the teachers that, that came up that for whatever reason made me feel just enough safety to speak up and tell somebody about what happened. And when, when, I, when, I, when I said that, um, I think it was Miss Piet. You remember M Mrs. Piet? Yeah. Man, yeah, she was livid. Yeah, she was livid when she heard me say that. She wasn't livid at me. She was livid yeah. that that happened. And she was like, what? Like, what? You know, like she was furious. Um, and she did have that teaching moment. She did do that, you know? And, and those kids got a talking to. And, and you can say... You can say, well, yeah, but 
did it really change anything? And I say, yeah, for me, because even if those kids didn't learn anything, the way she got angry on my behalf, the way she made it clear to everybody that this nonsense will not be tolerated in my classroom. Sure, she can't control what those kids say in their homes, but she sent a strong signal to me that said, yo, as a leader in this place, as a center of influence in this place, I want you to know, kid, I got your back and I'm not going to let anybody bully you over nonsense like that. That's the kind of stuff that awareness of implicit bias can help you do. Um, it can help Ooh. you not create a harm by taking a stand for what's right in a moment where you are the person that's got the greater measure of power and influence. Something yeah. that I, 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 I wanted to ask about to both of you guys, you know, related to your last point, TK, and, and I've rattled my brain really thinking about this. Um, but you talked about like your earned worldview, this earned perception that you have that over 20 years of, you know, life experience of challenges um, that you've had to overcome this um, and that you've developed this mindset. Right. And and I think part of me wants to know, you know, is is there a benefit in, in allowing kids to experience the challenges of racism, the challenges that that and, and, and letting them experience it as kids? Um, To, to help develop that mindset. You know, I, I hear a lot of times, you know, I listen to podcasts um, and, and wealthy people talk about the challenges of raising kids that didn't have to go through that same struggle, that that don't understand and, 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 um, and just have a certain respect and reverence for what they grew up having. You know, the parents understand, they understand the importance of it because they built it. And I think, you know, even in the black community, you you often hear like a lot of the elders say like, oh, y'all kids don't understand. Like y'all didn't have to go through it. I think this is a moment in history where we are going through it, where 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 it is, it's very uh, prevalent. And so what would you guys say to people who, you know, would, would want to shelter their kids away from this versus letting them be fully exposed to it um, to, to build that to build that worldview and build that strength and perception? Yeah, that that's a great question. And, you know, I, I think that's another thing in, in raising your your kids to develop that cross cultural IQ. That's a that's a very valuable piece. And I, and I think about this a lot, because, um, you know, oftentimes, we think that our job as parents is to protect our kids, to make sure they're safe, they're completely safe. I hope I'm saying this in the right way. Like, I don't want my children to, you know, get hit by a car, you know, so I'm not going to let them experience that, you know, and I know that that's not what you're talking about. But I think in terms of life experiences, um, you know, like preventing them from facing hard things or even experiencing failure at something, um, those things do help them to become better people, better individuals. Um, and I think to be able to do that, you have to be aware of each of your children, you know, of, okay, what my knowledge of this one's limits, how much they could mm. take, you mm. know, because because every one of them is different. Like, yeah. I know that my oldest one, like, oh, yeah, I'm not even worried if somebody does something to her because if they try to say something uh, racist toward her because I know she gonna handle it, and I and I trust her to handle it in an appropriate way. But she's gonna handle it. Um, there may be another one of my children where I know, like, nah, I I might have to walk him through this a couple of times until he gains awareness and he's able to stand on his own. And so I think that's having knowledge and awareness of where each one of your children are uh, mentally and emotionally. Um, and how much of that they can take. Because I know that when we pulled our kids out of the school, we felt like I, we had enough. <laughs> and so, and we know that, you know, at this point, I, it. yeah, I can't, I can't, at this point, like, so I, I'm, I remember after we pulled them out, 
I came downstairs and my oldest, she was sitting on the couch and she doesn't mind me sharing this. And she said, Dad, I'm really struggling today. And I said, wow, what's up? What's going on? And she says, I am trying so hard not to hate white people. I'm trying so hard. Mm. And so a part of me, you know, I my my knee jerk reaction was to say, well, you know, you know, there's a lot of good white people out there. You know, I wanted to come in <laughs> and, and, and give a, a knee jerk reaction. Uh, but something just said, just wait, you know, just just let her talk about her frustration and where she is. And so I said, OK, tell me more about that. <laughs> and I just let her talk. And then she began to say, and I know that that's not right because of uncle so-and-so and these people and the people in her life. And she began to come through it as I made space for her to just get the frustration out and to share the emotion. But mm. I think like that she was at her limits <laughs> and I couldn't allow her to be back in that situation. I had let them uh, suffer enough. You know, and I don't think that we should try to keep them from everything bad in the world because our kids, it's like what they talk about with this whole COVID thing. Like your immune system needs to take in some germs yeah. to be able to fight off other germs. And so I think healthy dosages of these negative experiences where they're able to process it and think through it, you're able to help them navigate it. I think they can get better at that as life goes on and they'll be better human beings for it is our hope. You know, I hope that gets at your question a little bit, but that would be my take. Mm. Mm. Yeah, man, I think that's right on the money. You know, for me, I think one of the most important things to teach is, is the distinction between responsibility and blame. I, I heard Wayne Dyer once say that, Mm -hmm. responsibility doesn't mean that you are in the position you are in because you deserve the bad things that have happened to you. Responsibility doesn't mean that it's your fault that your life is lacking in certain areas or that if you have been victimized or done wrong, that, you know, you got what was due. Responsibility simply means that you have the power to respond to any situation with ability. And I think sometimes what gets lost or underemphasized in messages of personal responsibility is this idea that you can't be honest about what your disadvantages are, or that you can't be honest about the challenges that you face, or you can't be honest about the bad things that have happened to you. And it is possible to be honest about all of those things without ad adopting um, a lifelong victim narrative. Right. Um, in fact, if you have been victimized, you know, if you have been abused, if you have been harassed, it would actually be intellectually dishonest. It would actually be delusional and anti self and anti reality to pretend that those things have not happened, you know, because part of overcoming what has happened to you involves looking at it in the face, coming to grips with the fact that I have been wounded in this particular way. And that was bad. And that is not my fault. And being responsible doesn't mean I take responsibility for other people's negative actions. It means yes. I take ownership of the fact that ain't nobody going to care about my life quite like me. And so I got to be the one to figure out how I'm going to process this. And I, and, and I take advantage of the relationships that I have in my life to help coach me through that process. And I think that's something that gets lost and you have to teach both. And, and too often in, in, in a lot of these discussions, once again, because of the politicization of the topic, People talk about this as if, you know, either you take responsibility for your life or you talk about problems. And, it, and it's no part of taking responsibility for your life is being real about your problems, even if it bothers everybody else that you're talking about those problems so that you can figure out the way that you can overcome the obstacles that are unique to your life, because we all have unique obstacles. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Hey, um, man, we're we're at the hour. You know what I wanted to talk? <laughs> you know, I wanted to talk to you about, about about church experience, man, and and about you know this this idea of uh, you know what it's like being in church. You know, we're gonna take an extra ten minutes. 
Uh, we're going to take an extra 10 minutes and talk about this. Let, let's talk about the gospel, Jesus, and, and, and this debate over social justice. I know one of the things you mentioned to me in previous conversation is um, being in, in, in multicultural churches, you've had some people say to you when you've addressed issues of our time like this, hey, man, let's just talk about love. Let, let's just talk about Jesus. We, we we don't like we don't have to talk about these things like race because that's divisive, that's uncomfortable. And I want to hear your thoughts on what you believe the gospel has to say about these kinds of topics we're talking about, and where does what direction does it put us in? Oh man, huh. so that's 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 a lot for an extra ten minutes, bro. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> hey, uh, we were on Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly only give you about thirty seconds, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. So here, here's what I would say. I think people have, some Christians have this view that Jesus is only concerned about saving souls. And what that means is, I want you to say the magic phrase so you believe in me, and then you can escape this physical reality <laughs> and experience this, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, this uh, mysterious, mysterious <laughs> ecstasy. And then one day when you die, you could come and spend forever with me and all your troubles will be over. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be yeah. hell now, but you know, hey, just put up with this because it'll be all rosy afterwards. And I think that the heart of the, the the Christian message, the gospel, is is the story of first of all, God being made flesh. You, it's the incarnation of, of Jesus that you have spirit and matter. You know, you have this union that he you know he doesn't he doesn't say, hey, I want you to ne negate your the physical part of you, the physical aspects of you. But I, I want you to live more into the spiritual realm. No, he's saying, no, these things are intertwined. They are interconnected. As a matter of fact, they, they're one in me. <laughs> and, um, and I think that somehow we've just made, we've, we've talked about the gospel in terms of just giving people, you get, you get it later. And I think that's why many people have a negative view of Christianity because it it thinks that it doesn't take in the taken um, seriously the struggles or real life when when you look at it Jesus his movement was about making social impact I mean his very first sermon is about you know bringing <laughs> bringing uh, good news to the poor you know, setting free the captives. And he's not just talking about this in a, in a spiritual way, right? You know, he's talking about opening blind eyes and, um, and he's not limiting, limiting it to spiritual blindness. And we know this by the stories we see in the scripture, that he goes to the least, the lost, and the lonely. Those who are ostracized, those, those who are pushed to the margins and he brings them front and center as to say that, no, these people have dignity too. These people matter too. As a matter of fact, these are the people that I have come, you know, for. And so I, I think that there is something um, missing. And I, and I, yeah, if, and, and maybe a lot of this depends on your context because I, I talk with people a lot about this and it tends to be people from uh, the majority of white churches. And I'm not saying all, but let me say in my experience, it's been white evangelical churches. Let me get just a little bit more specific here. Um, because I think there are many other churches out there that are doing good, they're doing a, a good work in this. But they will say, hey, you know, you you talked about racism and you talked about we we need to do more we need to fight for people that's we should keep politics out of the church and i'm thinking to myself like whoa mm. wh where do you get that from like if if we look at what the scripture talks about uh judgment day 
<laughs> when when uh, Jesus said, look, you know, he said many people said to him, look, we did this, we did this. And he's like, whatever, you know, you never really knew me. And then there's a group of people. He said, look, when I was in prison, you didn't come check me out. When I was sick, you you didn't come check me out. And he's basically identifying with those people who we consider to be the least. And so I want to say at the, at its core, like if the gospel doesn't have social implications, then what good is it? It, it, it yeah, doesn't you know so. Yeah. So you said, you said white evangelical, a lot of white evangelical churches. So I'm going to add a word to that and stay with me if y'all are listening. In my experience, it's been predominantly white evangelical conservative churches. And I, yeah. I, I think the reason why you find that kind of response there, I think it was very interesting that someone said, why we got to talk about politics when you were actually talking about the outcast, right? Um, so like when, when, when Jesus, you know, reached out to the leper or the tax collector or the, the, the various despised people of society, that's just, that's what compassion is, right? That's what redemption is. It, it's not politics, but there are certain matters of concern that have become so politicized that people hear that and they're unable to make the distinction between the left and the issue, right? So if I say, yeah. hey, Jesus taught that we should be generous and give to the poor, that immediately gets heard as, oh, you're a socialist, <laughs> right? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. We, we can have that conversation about socialism versus capitalism. That, that, that's a political and economic debate. But when Jesus says give to the poor, he's talking about a moral issue. He's talking about a life philosophy. And you don't need any government to pass a law or put a gun to your head to compel you to be generous or to be considerate, to be empathetic towards the plight of the poor. The plight of the poor. And I think I think the similar thing is going on with the race where there is this sense of or there's rather this inability to to listen to something like that. And be like, yeah, but uh, but but I, I don't want to vote in that direction, man. Or if if I if I acknowledge that that's something worth caring about, that means every leftist I've ever disagreed with, I'm I'm admitting that they're right. And it's like, no, man, that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than the kingdom of man, and this battle against good versus evil is not. It, 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 it's so much bigger and so much more important. Than, than the battle between left versus right. And, and you, you got to step beyond that paradigm. And sometimes as Christians, we identify more with um, uh, political leanings that, than we do with, with being in the kingdom of God. And, and we feel a lot, a lot more kinship with someone who, um, uh, you know, has no respect for Jesus, but, but, but claims the right side of the party line than someone who, um, is a brother or a sister in Christ, but but may have arguments with this about you know economics and politics. You know, it's it's funny you mentioned that because I remember I was having a conversation uh, with another pastor about a passage, uh, a scripture passage in uh, the book of Acts in the New Testament in the Bible, and um, it's in the second chapter. There's this phenomenon as people begin to join the early church that it says that they had all things in common. It says, you know, mm -hmm. people were selling property and they were making sure that they were taking care of everybody's needs. And he took time to say to me, I mean, and he was, he was dead serious. He said, you know, they put that in there to show us that communism is wrong because right after they did this, nobody started to join the church and see that's communism and that's not wrong that's not right you know we're not and i'm just thinking to myself like obviously this is seen as a good thing and i'm not sure that the early church was thinking of hey let's let's why don't we why don't we practice communism he equated that everybody had all things in common as equal to communism and i'm thinking like where where did you make that connection? You know, because I'm I'm quite sure that that wasn't the connection they made. Yeah, right. They they, they didn't they didn't go out with guns and force everybody to be a member of that church community, right? This was a voluntary community, and it was a great illustration of how generous people become when their lives are transformed by the love of Christ. They freely do it. 
they do more than any man-made law can, can compel them to, you know. But man, we, we have to wrap. I wish we could keep going. Oh man, so, so much goodness here, brother. I appreciate you you sharing a lot of those personal stories. I, I know that can't um that, that can't be easy, but I, I think it was good for me to hear, good for a lot of our listeners to hear. Um, hey man, are there any reading materials that you would recommend for people who are just kind of interested in, in learning more about some of the things we talked about, whether it's the the, the 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 gospel side of things or or the 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 raising kids side of things oh man oh gosh man um i know there's there's one book at the top of my list right now and it'll be released soon but i i got to shout out dr esau macaulay i think um esau macaulay is his name if you google him follow him on Twitter. Um, this guy, I think, is going to is one. Of, he's going to be one of the foremost theologians of our time. Um, studied under N.T. Wright, but he is he now is uh, he's finishing up a book called Reading While Black. And I've got mm. to hear him share some insights, you know, from that book. And it so I would say put that one at the top of your list. Um, I am thinking about, um, there's another author, uh, author by the name of Brenda Salter McNeil. Um, she has a book on reconciliation. I would say, look her up. Um, I don't know much about right now in terms of parenting, but I would definitely suggest reading through the gospels <laughs> um, with a, a lens of humility, right? recognizing that your viewpoint is your viewpoint. I can't ask you to, I can't say, hey, see it from my perspective, because you can't. But you can realize that in your objectivity, you can be you can be humble. <laughs> Just to say, hey, this is, this is where I am. And look at the scriptures and be humble in your reading. And, and ask, yeah. you know, even pray and say, help me, help me look at this differently. I love to tell people to, to go to the text and read them afresh. And, and see yeah. what you see again with new eyes. Man, I, I love it. So I, I, I'll, I'll well, go ahead. I, I was going to say, G, I was going to hop in and say thank you again for coming on and, and, and talking with us in the audience. Um, you know, it, it's always insightful, one, to get uh, some flesh and blood of the Coleman family to come on here and, and, and talk <laughs> about y'all experiences. Um, but two, just, you know, all the insight you provided on both aspects. And then just for the audience, I wanted... To, to remind everyone that in case you missed the beginning, uh, every Wednesday we're coming back live with one of these at 12 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you, guys. Stop it was an by. honor to be here with you. Hey, man. Hey, Likewise, hey. brother. Feelings are mutual. Wait, one last thing. Scotty and Mike are a better duo than LeBron and Wade. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> just... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was trying out. to capture the fact. I was trying to capture the fact that you had two alphas who were so confident in one another that that you know they was confused about who should take the shot. <laughs> yeah, hey man, my... thanks for having us, for us brother. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us, man. Peace out, y'all. <laughs>